In order to visit someone on death row in Raleigh, North Carolina, you have to get on the list, which is like filling out a job application for a minimum wage job at the mall. And then once you get on the list to go visit, you dress like you would to go get that job at the mall. <laughs> Clean and nice, but not your nicest. You don't want to stand out or look rich or eager or naive. Then you drive your crappy car to the prison. The guard in the parking lot says, are you on the list? You're on the list. And do you know the rules? You know the rules. He reads them to you anyway. They're all about what you can't do or carry inside the prison and how your visit can be canceled or ended at any time. Then you park and take the two things you're allowed, a notebook and a ballpoint pen, and start the long walk up the saddest sidewalk in the world, past a 20-foot chain-link fence topped with nasty fat curls of razor wire. On the other side of the fence is a big empty yard of dead grass. You walk slower and slower to the door of the giant brick building. Your body says, dumbass, turn around. Don't go in there. It's a big brick box of bad news. You're a kid. You like jam bands and psychedelic drugs and skinny dipping. You go to raves. This is the exact direct opposite of raves. <laughs> it's full of sadistic guards and desperate men with all these cute, clever tools for throat slitting and gut stabbing. Turn around. Don't go in there. You reach the building. Inside the door is a guard at a desk who checks your ID against the list and hands you a little yellow card with your name and today's date on it. You walk to another door, a bigger metal one. This is the first sally port. It's like the airlock in a movie spaceship. The door slides open, then slams behind you with what sounds like satisfaction. Between the two doors is a cloudy window of bulletproof glass with another guard behind it who looks at your yellow card and checks the list, the same list. He lets you through and goes back to his newspaper. You walk down a long, blank hallway to the next deeper layer. Another sally port, another guard. Same list, same cloudy window. The only thing that's different is the person. Male, female, white, black, skinny, fat. They all have the same expression. A mix of pity and disdain for you, for your presence here. You feel smaller and more trapped each layer in. You have to tell yourself to breathe. Finally, you get to the visiting room in the most secure layer of the prison. It looks just like the prison visiting rooms on TV. There are phones on either side of a big window, but unlike TV, the lights are really, really dim, and you're alone. There's no other visits going on. So you sit there alone on the hard metal stool, and you look through the glass and wait for the prisoner to be brought to you. And that's how you visit. 20 years ago, I left a brilliant North Carolina fall day to meet Steve McCone for the first time. I sat on the little mellow stool and watched the guard bring him in. I watched him offer his wrist to the guard. There's that really intimate moment where um, somebody lets, has somebody else take their handcuffs off. He was barely there, skinny little guy, really pale, barely held up his orange jumpsuit. Um, he nodded thanks to the guard who took his handcuffs off and sat down and picked up the phone on his side. We studied each other's faces. He was just a couple years older than me, the college kid, with a slack face and really sad eyes that fit his situation. He was super pale, like a country Boo Radley. He had a patchy, struggling mustache. He gave me the same ones over from his side. I'm sure he saw a hesitation that matched his. There was an obvious truth here that he knew very well and that was just starting to dawn on me. It's a really big deal to visit somebody on death row. When I don't know what I'm doing, I start talking. Hi, thanks for talking to me. Thanks for meeting with me. Steve shrugged his shoulders and smiled. Man, it's nice to have a visitor. I bet. Not too many people want to see me. And then right then, right off the bat, I had nothing to say. I did not say, well, yeah, you are a murderer, so... <laughs> I was stumped for the first of lots of times talking to this guy about what to say. I had found him through his lawyer. I called a death penalty attorney looking for an interview subject for my senior college paper in my anthropology major at the, at the university down the road. Because who better to describe the effects of our society's twisted approach to power and moral authority interpreted through the lens of the patriarchal and colonizing gaze and other popular academ academic uh, concepts of the mid-1990s than a convicted murderer who was waiting to be executed. 
I, I, I thought, swinging on the porch swing on, on my cozy little off-campus house of hippie kids. <laughs> let's, just, let's just skip on over to death row and cover all our postmodern theory bases. <laughs> so here's what I knew on that first day. In 1990, late one night in the rural mountains of North Carolina, Steve McCone shot and killed his mother and stepfather. He was convicted of both murders, sentenced to death by lethal injection, and sent to death row. In that first visit, I described my research project. I tried to avoid prissy academic words. I also wanted to avoid biasing him for or against my main theories for my paper. He asked a lot of questions about the research paper, and I got worried. I saw him thinking, nope, this is lame. You don't know what you're doing, not interested. I thought he was going to say, guard, like, they, like the guys do in movies when the girlfriend comes and tells him, I'm sorry, baby, but I'm sleeping with your brother now, and like, don't be mad. And it, but but he, wasn't, he wasn't really, he wasn't going to, you know, he wasn't uh, worried about that, or wasn't, um, he was worried more about himself. He was worried that he wasn't going to be up to the task of being an interview subject, that he wouldn't be able to tell his own story well enough to fit my research needs. I couldn't say anything, but it was me who wasn't good enough. Couldn't tell him that, I, but I'd been inside the prison for 10 minutes, and I was jumping out of my skin to get out of there. There was this huge thing I'd asked of him. I'd asked him to share his life, his whole story, and that story, his life, that was all he had left. He had nothing. That was all that he had that was actually his. And would my half-baked idea for this college paper actually do anything for him? I, I just had no idea what I was doing. I went to Central Prison every other Friday morning, 10 a.m. to noon, the whole school year. I walked in with anthropologist-type interview questions in my little notebook. The questions were personally intrusive and overly philosophical about the effects of isolation, his view of the guards, the treatment of criminals in society, his thoughts on the panopticon. <laughs> I would maybe have the balls to sort of ask one of those questions at each visit. We, talk, we would talk about whatever Steve wanted to talk about. I took notes and I decided I would figure them out later. We talked about his legal case and the couple of appeals that he had left, his daily routine. He was so pale because he didn't go outside even for the few minutes a, a day he was allowed. Oh yeah, man, I was always outside in the woods whenever I could. Those mountains are beautiful. He missed the sunshine, but going outside just made it worse to come back in. A tentative friendship formed, but very lopsided. I was in control of when and how often we met. He'd agreed to tell, him all, tell me all about himself, but I didn't make any similar promise. It never occurred to me to make any sort of promise to him at all. His parents split up when he was a little kid. He spent a week with his mother, who was a decent person, and then every alternating week with his father, who was a total disaster. Abusive, parked little Steve to sleep for the night under pool tables and sketchy bars, started him drinking before he was a teenager, Steve started using all kinds of drugs, dropped out of school, started robbing people. He said before he quit school, writing was his favorite, writing was his favorite subject. When he talked deep in his memories, he would pull on his mustache. It was a soothing gesture, like he was encouraging it to grow. He told me the deepest details of his life and his ideas, but I kept my distance. When he asked about me, I told him the most basic stats that I would tell anybody about my life. The basics of my family, school, music I liked, what I would tell anybody sitting next to me on the bus or on a plane. I definitely didn't tell him that I was gay, that I had recently started having sex with guys. This was the most important thing going on with me at the time. But as a Southern boy, um, talking to another Southern boy, I felt re I feared reject being rejected by him because he was so different from all the guys that I knew at school, everybody who was at this enlightened college from all over the world. Steve was like all the guys from my hometown. What if he hates facts, like the stereotypical hillbilly? He could decide he didn't want to have deep conversations with a gay guy and blow up my project. It didn't matter that he was a double murderer. I was worried about what he would think about, about me. And there was another reason I stayed in the closet from Steve. I didn't want to level the playing field. I did not want to be as fully human with him as he was being with me. I needed him to be more different from me than he really was. I needed to, to believe that there was more than one vicious and idiotic decision that was part of a shitty life and a dumb, reactive, violent streak that separated him from me and all my friends at college. He said he didn't remember the gun going off or chasing from one room to the other to shoot them both. He said maybe he was blackout drunk or maybe his memory was just hiding what he did from him somehow. He didn't know why he did it except I was really mad. 
It was jarring how easy it is to make really big mistakes. Maybe not shoot your mom big, but still, it seemed easy to end up in prison now that I knew this guy on death row. He told me about the hopelessness of knowing that everyone you had ever met and everyone you would ever meet knows you as the guy who killed his mom and stepdad. How lots of people, your family most of all, want you to be just dead and gone already. How right after he killed them, his brother ran into the room and Steve tried to hand the gun to him and told him to just shoot him and get it over with. How lots of days he still wishes his brother had shot him. How all that's not even the worst part. The worst is that you killed your mom and stepdad. The shotgun blasts and the blood and your mom falling over and dying at your feet, that's all as done as anything that's ever been done. It's over. And there's nothing, not one damn thing to do, but wait and die yourself because of it. At the end of a visit to someone on death row, it's really hard to say goodbye. The usual small talk doesn't work. You can't say, what are you up to this weekend? He told you once, and that's all there is, every day, all day. Even have a good one doesn't work, after talking about how regret traps you in time and destroys hope, and how no one helped you survive when you were too young to be responsible for your own survival. Okay, great, sounds good, later, man. <laughs> it's even harder to say goodbye to someone on death row when it's your last visit. We were both sad, but I was so relieved I couldn't hide it. He understood. I can't believe you came in here as many times as you did. This place really sucks, man. I told him I was moving to San Francisco and didn't say why. Even more freedom. The jackpot of everything gay. Gay culture, art, literature, dick, ass. He asked if I would write letters and I promised I would. He asked again at the end of the visit and I promised again. The last thing I remember him saying to me was, man, you are going to have the best life. In San Francisco, I found work and made friends. I wrote letters to Steve for three years or so. He wrote me back each time, long letters on lined notebook paper, the words skinny and faint, just like him. Still, I held back telling him about, it, about my life. It seemed too late to tell him how I was gay, how I hated the first gay bars I went to, how I loved the one I found later, how dating was fun and also really annoying. After a while, I stopped writing, and he stopped writing too. I looked him up several, several years later in my best life. Steve McCone was executed by the state of North Carolina in 2005. In the final orange jumpsuit headsuit on, headshot online, his mustache looked fantastic. That is his first time on the vamp stage, Hunter Gatewood.